Thanks for watching Coping with COVID-19, the daily video show and podcast from the journalists at Business in Vancouver newspaper. I'm Haley Wooden. The Conference Board of Canada says Canada's economy is now starting to recover from the deepest recession, but shortest recession in history. The board released this week some forecasts on what's to come for Canada's economy. And joining me now on our show is Pedro Antunes, Chief Economist at the Conference Board of Canada. Pedro, thanks so much for coming on the show. That's my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having me. Before we get to the recovery, I want to focus at least a little bit on the recession we've been through. What do the latest numbers tell us about just how deep this recession has been? Yeah, so, I mean, it's been so quick that uh, usually when we talk about Canada's economy, we talk about quarters uh, or the quarterly patterns, but, you know, it's been so quick and so deep that we're really focusing in on the monthly and even the half months. So we know that in March and April, we essentially made a policy choice uh, to shut down the economy to avoid the spread uh, of the virus, or at least uh, uh, slow the spread of the virus. And, um, and we've seen huge ramifications on economic activity in, those, in that period. Uh, so in March, second half of March, we, I mean, the first thing that got shut down was international tourism, uh, but then we shot down everything that was non-essential. Uh, and in April, we saw the ramifications of that with uh, the number of job losses. So we saw 3 million jobs lost in comparison to February. That's 15.6% uh, uh, of our workforce, if you can imagine. But even more so, if you look at the, the total number of hours work, which is more representative of you know, the work effort or the amount of activity, economic activity that we're really contributing to. The, so the total number of hours worked, which includes those people that lost their jobs, but also the, the ones that have reduced work hours, uh, that was a 28% decline from February. So it's huge, huge impact all in April. Uh, but as you mentioned, we're, we're starting to come back. What are your forecasts for how dim or how bright our economic prospects look, say second quarter, even throughout the rest of this year? Yeah, so so again, I think uh, we are through the worst of it, uh, but we're operating at such a low capacity right now, even as we saw some of the employment recovery in May, that was a good news story. Uh, we saw close to 300,000 jobs come back, but that's, uh, you know, 10% of what we lost, really. So there's a long way to go yet. And here's the issue is that um, we're, no, we're not going to really be able to operate at normal levels for a long time yet, uh, assuming, you know, and I'm no expert on the immunology side, but uh, what I'm reading is that it'll take probably a year before we have a vaccine or a treatment and that it's fully available. So in that period from now until uh, we, we, you know, a year from now, we're going to operate, the economy is going to be operating in this kind of, uh, you know, social distancing rules way. Uh, and that is going to continue to be, uh, to take away from our ability to kind of get fully back to normal, uh, get everyone back to work, et cetera. So there's a number of challenges that are going to stay with us for a while yet. To what extent do you figure our ability to recover quickly in the pace of that recovery, is it tied to finding that vaccine? How drastically might the numbers change if, for example, we don't have a vaccine in a year? Well, I'm very hopeful. So the scenario that we put in is that we do have a vaccine. I think there's so many being developed. Uh, and again, I'm no expert on this. I'm just uh, reading as, as everyone is uh, about where the progress is being made. So very hopeful that a vaccine or a treatment is available. Uh, I mean, if we do end up with a scenario where, you know, this is the new normal forever, I think that's something that we really have to be uh, dug into. But it would be, you know, we just essentially have to restructure the way we operate the economy more fundamentally if that were the case. So my hope is that uh, uh, we do see a, uh, an end to this uh, sooner or later, that this will be behind us and all forgotten about, hopefully. Uh, and uh, the challenge, I think, near term that we really need to focus on is you know, how do we really sustain uh, those businesses that are going to have trouble operating in this environment? Imagine if you're a restaurant, uh, how do you make a profit if you're only able to uh, bring in half the customers and yet you have uh, fully the cost? So, you know, it, it's costly to operate in this. You need more staff. You need to clean more often. Uh, all of these challenges. And then there's just one. 
That's a good point. I know you mentioned it seems like we're perhaps through the worst of it, assuming we don't have a second wave, assuming a vaccine is to come. But is it almost expected that over the months ahead, even if some businesses were able to hang on and remain open, that we still see some closures, we still see some job losses, simply because we're in such a very different operating environment? Yeah. Now, yeah, so certainly, you know, when we say uh, the labor market's picked up uh, in May, for example, we saw 300,000 jobs return. That's on aggregate, right? Of course, there's jobs lost in there that we just have more of these. Uh, and over the coming months, I do think that there's going to be businesses that are going to see uh, these challenges of operating in this environment really uh, essentially force them to shut down. Uh, so we are going to see bankruptcies. I think, um, uh, you know, when we talk about waves of the virus coming back, you know, hopefully we're not going to see any of it. Uh, and I don't think we can afford a full shutdown like we did in April, uh, March and April. Uh, but, lo- uh, you know, there's going to be a lot localized shutdowns here and there if there's virus you know, re- re-emerging in certain areas, et cetera, as we've already seen. But I think that's the environment that we're going to operate in. Uh, we're uh, certainly, that's what we're assuming. We don't often make policy recommendations when we're in our forecasts, uh, but we do think that there's going to be a need for additional support for businesses. Like, so to serve the direct transfers to households has, has been very effective and been very um, uh, generous uh, to date. It's being extended, et cetera. We think the focus should really be now on a wage subsidy to ensure that businesses can uh, essentially bring back their employees and operate profitably, hopefully with that wage subsidy in an environment that is going to be changed. Seems from business's perspective, the focus for now and in the short term is really on getting by. It seems almost strange to talk about business investment, but what are some of the trends you're seeing related to private sector investment? Oh, that's a really good question. And um, you know, this is something that's concerned us for a number of years now. Uh, and you know, people will know that the resource sector, oil and gas in particular, has been very hard hit since, in fact, since 2015 when oil prices collapsed back then. Uh, they've taken a further hit now. Uh, so the resource sector certainly is one where uh, there's a number of challenges, especially now as we're seeing global demand uh, really shrivel this year and uh, it's probably gonna pick up slowly for a lot of commodities including that. Uh, I, I think aside from that, uh, when we think about investing in uh, Canada's investment performance, it's been really not very strong at all. Think about retooling investment, think about technology, AI, et cetera. I mean, we talk a lot about it. We talk about disruption, but it's not really showing up in the investment bond. And, and I do think that this may be an opportunity in some respects um, uh, to, to challenge the new business. We've already seen a huge amount of take up in terms of technology uh, for people working at home. Uh, we, we've seen e-commerce sales really take off. I think these are the kinds of uh, perhaps longer term, uh, if I can call them activity enhancements that we may see uh, operating or, or as a result of having operated in this, in this environment. So hopefully some of these positives will stick. Tele- telecommuting is I'm sure another one you, you might be thinking about, um, but these do require uh, businesses to invest. Uh, right now it's been a difficult time. Um, you know, and, and I guess if I might add just one other thing, I think the other challenge is tax competitiveness and uh, access to the U.S. market. So hopefully with the new NAFTA that we have in place now, access to the U.S. market is, like, uh, I, I know that with the current U.S. administration, it's always a bit challenging, uh, but the other one is tax competitiveness, and we need to keep that in mind given the fiscal situation that we're going to face in 2022, 2023, and, and therefore. therefore On the topic of the United States, Canada is in a very different position relative to our neighbor to the South when it comes to the state of our pandemic. To what extent is our recovery tied to the United States recovery and their ability to deal with say the economic consequences of the pandemic? Yeah, and obviously that is a really important issue as well. And um, you know, we have challenges on, I just talked about some of the challenges on investment. Uh, One of them has been investing in manufacturing and other technology to get product to the U.S. market, for example, and that's been lacking. So we haven't seen a lot of growth in our exports to the U.S. And then we have seen a a fair amount of growth in exports to China, but of course now we're facing all sorts of challenges and trade restrictions uh, with respect to that market, not to mention uh, the fact that demand is going to get. So where where do we go from here? 
Um, and uh, so the investment piece is an important part, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, even if we're not growing, we're still very, very dependent on the uh, U.S. as a, an export market for trade, 75% essentially of our goods. So that's uh, key. Uh, how will they get through this pandemic? Will we see demand for autos, for example, resume and grow in the U.S. and trying to help our manufacturing sector, which is almost 80, well, 85% of our manufacturing is focused at the U.S. consumer. You could talk about machine equipment, electronics, consumer goods. These are all products that um, you know we sell into the U.S. as the major consumer for us. For us. So trade, uh, how should I say, trade snags and, and uh, issues aside, um, you know, if the U.S. isn't successful in containing the violence, as you know, hopefully we will be able to do that. Uh, we need to see that happen in the U.S. as well. Uh, so that we see that economy. The report you put out this week also looks at some changes or trends related to consumer behavior. Obviously, businesses recovering, having people come out to restaurants, having people buy things from stores. Their recovery is tied to what consumers are going to be doing and how they're going to be behaving. How much of an impact has COVID-19 had on consumer spending? You know, what well, we mentioned about early on, supply shock, demand shock, well, it doesn't matter. Everything was shut down. And so we really hit consumer spending. It's obviously showing up in, in, in some of the retail trade numbers, et cetera, that we've been getting for a while now to date. But I think the more interesting question is, you know, as we look ahead um, and we are seeing, um, you know, the economy will open up, how much will consumers really go out there and spend? How active will they be in this interim period until things really do get truly back to normal? Uh, and that's a really good question. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of suggestions that consumers may change fundamentally, that uh, you know, we may not be so, uh, how should I say, such a consumer society. We may see a higher savings rate. In the main respects, that's not a bad idea for households in Canada whose who savings rates have been really eroded and we've been dependent on a lot of debt uh, to finance that consumption. So I, I think that uh, that's a question mark. Uh, personally, I you know I've been at this a long time, and typically, you know, when income is there, household spending is there. Uh, so that's my experience, and I would go as that with the first uh, first bet. As long as, uh, and especially, the, the income has to be there and the confidence has to be there. So the income, I would argue, we've seen a huge amount of support from the federal and provincial levels of government that are helping to maintain household income despite the fact that we're living in a very deep recession. So households on aggregate are in pretty good shape through this recession. Um, so the challenge is, you know, how to ensure that households have confidence going forward. And I think there the key is they need to be assured or at least somewhat assured that their employment is going to come back and that they're going to have income uh, over the longer term. And I think that's the key. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's almost this cog and wheel, but it, you know, it's a virtuous cycle, if you'd like. We need both to happen uh, for the economy to get back to the office. Has the issue of record high household debt become more of a concern in terms of the health of our broader economy because of what's happened related to COVID-19? Or is it, for now, it seems as though it's been managed, there's been enough support from government, mortgage deferrals have been on the table? Yeah. Well, you know, the really interesting thing, that this is when you do all the math, despite the fact that we have, you know, a huge amount of jobs lost in this economy. Um, and over this year, for example, in 2020, on average for the year, we're expecting, you know, a 5.7% upon unemployment, or for others that like the numbers, 1.1 uh, million jobs gone this year. Now, a lot of them will happen in March and April, will come back, but on average, a million jobs lost. Uh, despite that, the support measures are, are so generous that we're actually seeing aggregate household income, not the compensation income, but the transfers and all of that supporting positive gains in aggregate household income. So the savings rate has actually taken off this year. Uh, and I call it a bit of a slingshot. It's that issue around, you know, once confidence is back, we, we will see that, uh, that spending come back. So, uh, you know, I think the, this is, um, uh, the issue of household debt is kind of out of the way for now. I, I think it's something that uh, we need to be aware of. Uh, interest rates right now are kind of rock bottom, and I think uh, uh, you know that's um, that is certainly positive to, to help support households through this uh, rough patch. Uh, but for now, I think the for me the bigger concern is around businesses being able to survive through this period. 
uh, rather than hospitals because of the, the support that's been directed mostly at hospitals. Are interest rates expected to remain low for the foreseeable future? Yeah, that's a really good question, isn't it? Uh, so, you know, of course, uh, the central banks um, are expecting that the economy will remain weak, inflation will remain weak. Uh, and if inflation remains weak, you know, we, uh, we can see the central banks keeping interest rates very low. Uh, Canada has also entered what's called quantitative easing. You may recall those terms that back in the 2008-2009 recession. Now, back then, every other, pretty much every other developed economy went into that quantitative easing, but not Canada. But this time around, we have done so as well. And, and quantitative easing is, is, in essence, you know, the bank can print money. Uh, lucky in, in its ability to do so. We all wish we could, but we can't. So the bank can print money and actually purchase assets off the balance sheets of, sorry, when I say the bank, I mean the central bank. Uh, they can purchase assets off chartered banks. Uh, and so, um, or from the government, for example, they can purchase bonds. So quantitative easing is essentially injecting a lot of liquidity, a lot of money into the system as the central bank purchases assets. Uh, and it has a twofold increase. It increases liquidity, and it lowers interest rates, bond yields, et cetera, by, you know, essentially, if you purchase a lot of bonds, it's going to lower the price of the bonds, which is the yield or the interest rate. So it flattens the interest rates. It gets longer-term interest rates, interest rates uh, down. So sorry, uh, you know, a lot of explanation around that. But what's different really this time is the fact that we've gone in not just government bonds that we've purchased, but uh, corporate bonds, uh, provincial government bonds. We bought mortgage debt, so we've got a lot of uh, for me, the question is, how do we remove that when the time comes without having an impact on raising uh, interest rates too strongly? And the other big concern, of course, for central banks all over the world will be uh, inflation. And I know the governor of the central bank, both uh, the Polos and Macron, uh, now have been talking about deflation of risk. Potentially, I think that there's, uh, there's some risks there. But I would argue that uh, uh, operating in this COVID environment, there's a lot of inflationary and cost-driven pressures. So I think near term, uh, you know, we need to keep our heads up for, uh, for the, the signs of inflation. I think the bank would be concerned if we start seeing that. Mm -hmm. One final question for you, Pedro. I know we've been focusing on the state of the national economy, but I'd be curious for your insight on the position of British Columbia's economy and what our economic prospects look like, say, relative to what's happening at the national level. Yeah, well, uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think we, um, we are seeing a very, very similar story in terms of the shutdown. You know, when I talk about, you know, how quick and, and fast this was happening on a monthly basis, uh, the other thing that's uh, that's kind of a bit shocking is how synchronized this has been. It, with the exception of China, really, that uh, got hit early, pretty much every other economy in the world has been hit. Uh, you know, the early ones perhaps starting in February and the later ones, you know, the peak happening in April, but really synchronized in terms of the impacts. So uh, uh, when we look across all of our provinces here in Canada, we're seeing very much a similar story. Uh, they've all been very, very hard hit by the shutdown. Uh, we're hopeful that as uh, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing a little bit of difference, I guess, is on the tail end of it, how we come out. Some of the social distancing measures uh, have been relaxed more slowly and more quickly, and depending on which reasons. But I think overall, we're going to see a similar picture coming out of this as well across provinces, uh, where, you know, you know, again, it's on a monthly basis, but the delays on a monthly basis won't really change the time. So we're seeing, I don't know if I mentioned, but we're seeing, a, we're expecting about an 8%, 8.5% uh, decline for GDP in Canada this year. Uh, you know, uh, BC, we're looking at a similar situation as we do economic performance. Uh, I think coming out of this, BC's long-term prospects are still very solid. Um, you know, the province is developing an LNG. Uh, the province has a, uh, the ability to, as trade reopens, really to get uh, its um, a gateway, you know, performing again and, and contributing to the economy. Uh, a, a lot of resources in, in the province and a lot of high tech industries as well. So I, I think, you know, we're going to have to suffer through this tough period, uh, especially on the resource side. That's going to be tough well into 2021. 20, uh, uh, tourism, of course, as you mentioned, is also another important industry for BC, and, and that will be hard hit also until we think mid 2021, uh, given those assumptions that we talked about earlier. So, 
Yeah, I'm afraid it's a tough year for BC. I, you know, I would I would argue that longer term, we, I think the province is in, is in good shape throughout this matter. But uh, the, the very near term, it's going to be a very big year, just like the US. Unfortunately, none of us can escape the economic consequences of COVID-19, only if we could. Pedro, such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for coming on the show with your insight. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's Pedro Antunch, Chief Economist at the Conference Board of Canada, and this has been Coping with COVID-19 from Business in Vancouver. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with another video and podcast.